Hey everyone, previously you learned about the macromolecules, proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and lipids. And today we're talking about cells, which are the smallest living unit, and the parts that make them up, which are called organelles. So first, let's review the cell theory. You probably learned about this in middle school or high school. The cell theory says that cells are the building blocks of all plants and animals, and that all new cells come from the division of pre-existing cells. You might have learned about mitosis in a previous biology class. And as I mentioned, cells are the smallest living units, and they are capable of carrying out all essential physiological functions. In fact, they help maintain homeostasis at an individual level, but they also work in coordination to maintain homeostasis at the organismal level. So they are super important. And the better we understand cells, the better we understand how the human body works. So one thing that we should know to get started is how do we have so many different kinds of cells in our bodies that are capable of doing really different things? So basically we have four tissue types and each of those tissues is made up of cells and those four tissue types are epithelial tissue, for example, like your skin and the kinds of cells that line your respiratory passage. We have connective tissue, which would include, include bone and blood. Um, we have muscle tissue, which of course is all of your muscles. And then we have nervous tissue, which are made up of neurons and glial cells. These cells are all really different and they do different things. So how do we start with a single fertilized egg and end up with all these different kinds of cells? Well, cells go through the process of differentiation and specialization. So as that fertilized egg undergoes many, many, many rounds of mitosis to go from one cell to a trillion cells, those cells will differentiate. That is to say, they are going to either activate or inactivate certain genes in their nuclei that will dictate the kinds of things that they do, and in turn, that will dictate the kind of cell that they are. And specialization is the process of a cell becoming the actual cell type that it's gonna be. And typically speaking, once cells are specialized, if they undergo mitosis, they can only produce those kinds of like cells. Um, that's a general statement. We do have some stem cells. You might have learned about totipotent and multipotent cells, for example, uh, but that's beyond the scope of this lecture. All right, if we think about the parts that make up cells, we would be talking about organelles. So these are all of the little structures that we find in eukaryotic cells that help the cell to do all of the things that it does. And we can actually take those organelles and divide them up into two groups. And these two groups um, are going to be the non-membranous organelles and the membranous organelles. So True organelles are the membranous organelles. That is to say, their structure includes a bilipid cell membrane around the outside. And that's going to include things like mitochondria, the nucleus itself, endoplasmic reticulum, and some others that we're going to talk about. But there's a whole other group of organelles that don't have that membrane, but they are just as important and they do really important things as well. And that's going to include things like the cytoskeleton, which gives a framework to the cell. It's going to include centrioles, which play an important role in mitosis, things like ribosomes. So again, we're going to talk about a number of different kinds of non-membranous organelles. And you can see from this diagram that if we think about the cell, um, we can see it as a plasma membrane around the outside that separates the inside of the cell from its external environment. And inside the cell is cytoplasm, which is sort of a salty, jelly-like, watery substance. And then floating around in that, we are going to have the organelles. So if you are including the liquid part and the organelles, we call that cytoplasm. The liquidy insides of the cell are just uh, is just called cytosol. So not a huge deal, but you might notice those two terms because they're a little bit similar, but they don't mean exactly the same thing.
So here's a classic rendition of a cell um, identifying many of the organelles that we're going to talk about. You do want to be able to recognize the various organelles in a diagram such as this. You'd want to be able to identify them, that is name them and be able to spell their name correctly most likely, and to be able to describe what their basic structure is and what their basic function is. So that's what we're going to move into um, next. So again, thinking about the cell, as I said, it is a plasma membrane on the outside that separates the cell from its external environment, and then it is filled with cytoplasm, which includes the cytosol and the organelles. So the cytosol is the liquidy part. It does have things dissolved in it, like salts and sugars and whatnot. And then the organelles are all of the smaller structures that help compartmentalize the functions of the cell. So each organelle kind of does a specific thing that contributes to its overall function. The largest organelle in most cells is the nucleus, um, and it is surrounded by the nuclear envelope um, and filled with nucleoplasm, which is an awful lot like cytoplasm, but it just happens to be in the nucleus. And of course, its job is to control the metabolism um, or the work of the cell. It stores genetic information, and it plays a very important role in protein synthesis. Um, interesting little thing that you'll learn about more in AMP2 is that not all cells actually have a nucleus. So red blood cells are an example of cells that do not have a nucleus, and that has really um, big implications for the lifespan of the cell and the ability for the cell to function. So again, you'll learn a little bit more about that in the future. All right, let's start with the nucleolus, which is something we call a transient organelle. That's a fancy way of saying that sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. The nucleolus is located inside the nucleus. Very similar spelling, so watch out for that. You don't want to write nucleolus when you mean nucleus. Um, so the nucleolus is where ribosomes are made. They are one of the non-membranous organelles that we'll talk about in a little bit. So ribosomes are made in two parts inside the nucleus within the nucleolus and they are made in two parts because the nucleus is surrounded by that nuclear envelope and that nuclear envelope is actually a double membrane and it has these little pores in it that are really hard um, for most things to move in or out of the nucleus and that's on purpose to protect the DNA. So in order to move the ribosomes out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm where we need them, they have to be made in two parts so that they're small enough to fit through the nuclear pores. So kind of an interesting little thing going on there. Now, vesicles are another um, membranous um, organelle, and they are little membrane-bound sacs. They can bud off of the endoplasmic reticulum or the Golgi body that we'll talk about, or they might even invaginate in from the cell membrane as part of the process of endocytosis, for example. And basically what vesicles do is they are going to transport things around the cell or act as like a storage closet for the cell. And they're a little bit hard to find in your book, so I just share it with you that you can learn a little bit about them on page 103 in your book if you were looking that up and having a hard time finding it. All right, a couple of my favorite organelles, um, I call them the garbage crew because they're really good at cleaning up. They are peroxisomes and lysosomes. These are very similar organelles, both membranous organelles. So they have a membrane. They look exactly like vesicles. They have a membrane that creates like a little sac or a little hollow ball. Um, the difference is that in peroxisomes and lysosomes are enzymes that can break down particular substances. So inside peroxisomes, we're going to find an enzyme called catalase, and catalase is really good at breaking down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. And that's really good because hydrogen peroxide is toxic to our cells, and it's actually the result of a bunch of metabolic reactions. So we want to have a way to clear that hydrogen peroxide so that it's not dangerous to us, and that's what peroxisomes do. Peroxisomes also can break down fatty acids, and in addition to breaking things down, cool little weird thing about them, they can actually synthesize cholesterol, bile, and myelin, depending on what cell they're in. So they do cool stuff. Lysosomes 
again, look just like a vesicle or a peroxisome, but they're going to have lysozyme, which is another enzyme, and those enzymes are really good at breaking down organic compounds like old, worn out organelles and also pathogens like bacteria. Um, and a pretty famous disease that you might have learned about in high school is Tay-Sachs disease. This is when the lysosome doesn't function properly as a result of a genetic defect in the DNA. And the consequence is that these cells, your neurons, can't break down a lot of these organic compounds. And so the neurons get filled up with this sort of garbage of organic compounds and it prevents the neurons from working. And so um, individuals with Tay-Sachs typically don't survive past the age of six. Um, many die by the age of two. Um, so it's, it's a pretty serious disease and it's, it's uh, kind of heartbreaking for people um, that have to experience that with their children. All right, so here's a good diagram um, showcasing how lysosomes um, might work. So you can see here off of the Golgi apparatus that we have a lysosome forming. So here's our empty lysosome filled with lysosome. And then what may happen is like an old organelle may join up with it and that lysosome can digest that old organelle and then eventually it may um, the cell may absorb anything good you know any little things that could be reused and then the rest of it will just be exocytosed out of the cell um, we also can see here we have some endocytosis happening so something is being taken in by the cell so this would be a vesicle right here and then that vesicle with whatever was taken in joins up with the lysosome and then that allows whatever we brought into the cell to be broken down. Uh, we, again, we may absorb any goodies that are in there and we can exocytose any junk that we don't want. So that's kind of a, a basic way that lysosomes work. Um, and if lysosomes break open in the cell accidentally, their enzymes can actually destroy the cell and that's called autolysis. It's not something we want to happen. But sometimes cells break down on purpose, um, and that's called apoptosis. Um, and that's something that will come up when we talk about mitosis and cancer. Um, you may also hear about it more in AMP2. Okay, ribosomes. Now, these are non membranous organelles, so they don't have a membrane around them. Ribosomes are really just made up of protein and RNA. Um, and so what they are going to do is synthesize proteins. So ribosomes are going to hang out in the cytoplasm. And when an mRNA, which is the directions to make a protein, are available to them, they will assemble the amino acids in the correct order based on the mRNA to form the protein. And now the cell will have that protein. Sometimes ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. We call it the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Sometimes they are just free in the cytoplasm. So we have two kinds of endoplasmic reticulum. We'll have the rough endoplasmic reticulum, as I mentioned, when ribosomes are attached to it, making it look rough on the outside. This is where new proteins are chemically modified and folded. So it's a kind of a safe space for folding proteins into their final shape. And the shape of a protein is really important. And then from the rough endoplasmic reticulum, those new proteins would most likely go to the Golgi via a vesicle. Um, and they are, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is continuous with the nuclear envelope. Um, and so we sometimes refer to the tubular structures of the endoplasmic reticulum as cisterni. Now there's another type of endoplasmic reticulum called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It does not have any ribosomes attached to it. Um, and this is where we're going to see the synthesis of lipids. So instead of proteins, like in the RER, here in the smooth ER, we're going to see the production of phospholipids. That's going to include things like cholesterol, sex hormones, and glycerides. And also in some cells, like skeletal muscle cells and liver cells, we're going to see that smooth ER is really good at synthesizing and storing glycogen. And we may also see smooth ER um, serving as a storage site for calcium. So uh, again, some of these organelles can do different functions depending on the type of cell that they are in.
Here's a little uh, diagram of sort of the basic difference between them. Very similar in structure, but the big idea um, is that the rough endoplasmic reticulum has those ribosomes on it. The Golgi apparatus or Golgi body, um, to me, it looks like a stack of pita breads. We're seeing that right here in these purple structures right here. So proteins from the rough endoplasmic reticulum or lipids from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum can travel to the cis face of the Golgi. That's where they're, they'll enter the Golgi. And then in the Golgi, they may be stored or altered or modified and then packaged up and then shipped via a vesicle to their final destination, wherever that might be, maybe outside the cell, maybe to the cell membrane, wherever it needs to go. And when vesicles leave the Golgi, they leave from the trans face of the Golgi body. So the cyst is where vesicles enter and the trans face is where things are transported out to their final destination. Okay, everybody's heard of the mitochondrion, but please, please, please don't call it the powerhouse of the cell. I mean, you can call it that, but that's not a, a scientific answer to what the function of the mitochondrion is. The function of the mitochondria is that it produces ATP using oxygen, um, and that ATP is a usable form of energy for the cell. So some interesting things about the mitochondrion is that it has a double membrane, kind of like the nucleus. Um, we're also going to see double membranes in chloroplasts in plants, so it's not a totally unusual thing, um, but that inner membrane is going to be highly folded and that's going to increase the surface area because all of the chemical reactions required to make ATP, all of those reactions are facilitated by enzymes and those enzymes need to be embedded somewhere. They don't like to just float around. They like to be on or adjacent to a membrane so that inner membrane is really convoluted so that there's lots of surface area for those enzymes. And again, essentially what's going to happen there is we are going to use oxygen as a final electron acceptor. That just means that oxygen is uh, very attractive to electrons and your cells take advantage of that in order to make ATP in a very efficient manner. So if we have oxygen available, we can break down sugars to collect a lot of ATP very efficiently. Um, that process is called oxidative phosphorylation. Um, if we don't have oxygen present, we can still make ATP, but we can't do it very efficiently, and we might not be able to make enough ATP to meet the needs of the cell or the body. So we need to know a little bit about how mitochondria make ATP. It's also known as aerobic respiration. Um, this is going to come up again in the muscle unit, so you'll have kind of more than one opportunity to kind of learn it and answer questions about it. Repetition is always good when you're learning about hard things. So let's break it down um, really simply. Let's start by saying that if we're talking about aerobic respiration in the mitochondria, there are three stages. So the first thing you need to do is memorize what the three stages are. They are glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain and ATP synthase action. So that's a lot right there, but you, you can do that. Memorize that. The next thing you need to know is what do we mean by each of those things? Like what's the big thing that happens in each of those stages? So basically in glycolysis, lysis means to split. Glyco refers to sugar or glucose. So in glycolysis, we are going to split glucose in half. And that actually happens in the cytoplasm, not the mitochondrion. In the citric acid cycle, we're going to take those two half sugars, which are called pyruvates, and we are going to further break them down in order to collect some things from them that we want, which are going to include things like hydrogen protons. Well, really, it's just a proton. It's like an H+, which is a proton, um, and electrons. And one of the consequences of doing that is we're going to give off some CO2, which is one of the reasons why we breathe out CO2. Then the last stage is the electron transport chain and ATP synthase action. That's a lot. In the electron transport chain, electrons that we collected from glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, we are going to move them down a chain of special enzymes that release energy so that we can create an electrochemical gradient 
inside the mitochondria. And then that allows us to make a lot of ATP because when we create a concentration gradient across the membrane inside the mitochondria, if we have a channel for those uh, hydrogen ions to flow down, they will flow through ATP synthase. That's the channel. And when they flow through ATP synthase, it spins a little turbine inside the enzyme at the molecular level. And that allows us to make a whole bunch of ATP by taking ADP and adding a phosphate to it. And that's oxidative phosphorylation. Because this whole thing wouldn't work if we didn't have oxygen drawing the electrons down the electron transport chain. So it's a lot of high level stuff to learn about. So focus on the big picture at each stage, like be able to name the stage, be able to give a brief description of the most important thing that happens in that stage, and then think about what goes into each stage and what comes out of each stage. And so if you just learn it in little chunks, it makes it a lot easier. So here's another picture, and I kind of like this one. It reminds us that we have that inner membrane that's really folded, and this is where the electron transport chain is going to be. So that's the basic structure of the mitochondria. Up here, we have the formula for aerobic respiration, so glucose plus oxygen after a series of chemical reactions will give us carbon dioxide and water, but what we care about are the 38 ATP, roughly 38. Some people say 36, some people say 42. Um, that's the general formula for aerobic cellular respiration. If we look here, we can see that in stage one, called glycolysis, we're going to take glucose and we're going to break it into pyruvic acid. When we do that, we're going to get a little bit of ATP, not a lot, but a little bit, and we're going to collect some electrons and some protons. Then the pyruvic acids or pyruvate is going to enter stage two, which is the citric acid cycle. The old name is the Krebs cycle. We're going to break down that pyruvate even more, which is going to release CO2 that we can breathe out. It's also going to produce a tiny little bit of ATP, but not much. And we're going to collect some more electrons and hydrogen protons. And then we're going to send all of those electrons and protons over to stage three. The electrons will go down the electron transport chain, which is located on the highly folded inner membrane. And we will use the energy from those falling electrons to pump a bunch of hydrogen ions across the membrane to create a really high concentration of hydrogen or protons um, in between the two membranes, which means they're going to want to flow back into the middle but they can't flow across a cell, the, excuse me, the plasma membrane because they're positively charged. So they can only get across the membrane if there's a channel for them, and that channel is ATP synthase. And so when the protons flow down their concentration gradient through ATP synthase, we use that kinetic movement to attach a phosphate to an ADP, and voila, we have ATP, and we can do that a lot when we have a whole bunch of protons flowing through ATP synthase. And again, the only reason why the electrons went down the electron transport chain was because there was oxygen to draw them down it. And it's those falling electrons that allow us to pump all of the hydrogen ions, protons, in order to create a concentration gradient so they would flow back down um, their gradient through ATP synthase so we could make all of that ATP. So these things are all connected. I know it's complicated, but just... Focus on the major events, and I think you'll be okay. All right, that brings us to the cytoskeleton. This is what gives the cell its shape, its strength, and flexibility, and there's a lot of different parts to the cytoskeleton. So we're going to have the microfilaments, um, which are going to be really important in skeletal and cardiac muscle cells. You'll learn a lot more about them in the muscle unit. Um, they are important for cell shape um, and providing strength. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, they're going to be really important in muscle cells um, for contraction. We're going to have intermediate filaments. These are in pretty much all cells. There's different kinds of them. They are very strong and they allow us to move things around the cytoplasm like vesicles. Um, and then we're going to have thick filaments. They are also going to be found in skeletal and cardiac muscle and are going to be really important with um, muscle contraction. So you'll learn more about those in that unit. 
We're gonna have microtubules. These are going to be very important in moving organelles around, um, and they are also going to play a very important role in mitosis that you'll learn more about. Um, centrioles are also going to play a role in mitosis and have a unique organization um, known as nine plus two. So there's nine groups of microtubules that are organized into these triplets. It's kind of beyond the scope of this class, but it's just kind of what they're famous for. Um, and then we have cilia and flagella. These are structures that extend off of the cell. Cilia are going to be important in your respiratory cells to help lift mucus up and out of the lungs, for example. And flagella are really important for um, moving cells. So we're going to see them um, on sperm cells. It allows sperm to swim um, to try to reach the egg and fertilize it. So lots of different cytoskeleton there. So cytoskeleton is a great example of proteins, right? We have lots of proteins. All enzymes are proteins. Your cytoskeleton is proteins. So there's functional proteins, there's structural proteins, there's transport proteins. But the question becomes, how do we make or synthesize all these proteins? Well, in order to make the proteins that your cell depends on, we actually have a whole bunch of organelles working together. So let's remind ourselves that proteins are coded for by the genes that are in your DNA. So most genes code for a protein. I don't want to get into the, the depths of that, but for now it works for us to say that genes code for proteins. So the directions for how to build a particular protein are found in a particular gene. So if we can make a copy of that gene, because remember your DNA is located in the nucleus, but proteins are going to be synthesized in the cytoplasm. So we have to have a way to get the directions from the DNA, from the genes in your DNA out to the cytoplasm. So that process of copying a gene in the nucleus and then making the protein in the cytoplasm is called protein synthesis. And the fancy names for those two parts of the process are transcription and translation. So transcription is what happens in the nucleus and translation is what's going to happen in the cytoplasm. Transcription in the nucleus is about making a copy of the DNA Translation in the cytoplasm is about actually assembling a protein that can function in the cell or elsewhere. So transcription is just making an mRNA copy of DNA, and that's going to happen in the nucleus. So basically, because the DNA can't leave the nucleus, because that's its safe place, we don't want anything to happen to the DNA, the only way we can get the directions out to the cytoplasm, to the ribosome, is to make a copy of it. And so mRNA is just a copy of a gene, and the process of opening up the DNA and reading the gene and making an mRNA copy of it, that's transcription. And mRNA is then able to exit the nucleus through the nuclear pore because it's going to have a little sort of secret password attached to one end of it that will allow it to exit through that nuclear pore. Again, it's very hard to move in and out of the nucleus. You have to have the molecular password to move across a nuclear pore. So basically, in order to do this, we're going to have to uncoil the DNA at the gene that we're interested in. That's often, so we uncoil the DNA and then we unzip the, uh, the ladder, if you will. So we separate the two sides so that we can read the gene and make a complementary copy of the DNA. That's going to give us our mRNA. And then that mRNA is going to be modified inside the nucleus with a five prime cap and a poly A tail. Those two things will stabilize the mRNA so it doesn't fall apart. And it's what will allow it to exit out through the nuclear pore. So First, we got to copy the gene, and then we have to modify it with a five prime cap and a poly A tail to stabilize it and let it exit out into the cytoplasm. Once it's out in the cytoplasm, that mRNA is going to attach to a ribosome, and then the ribosome is going to assemble the correct amino acids, because remember, amino acids are the monomers of proteins. So the ribosome will assemble the correct amino acids in the order dictated by the mRNA, which is a copy of the gene. Those amino acids are delivered to the ribosome on tRNAs or transport RNAs. They 
the transport RNA has an anticodon that matches the codon on the mRNA strand. And that tRNA will only hold the amino acid that it codes for. So that's how we deliver the right amino acid to the right spot on the mRNA strand when it's attached to the ribosome. If that ribosome is attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it will feed that um, protein as it's being built into the middle of the rough ER. And once it's completely made, then that protein can fold up into its final shape so that it can carry out its function. Again, the shape of a protein is very important to its function. Anything that changes the shape of the protein or denatures the protein will likely mean the protein won't be able to carry out its function. If you'd like to see or learn more about this, there is a great animation, um, actually a couple of videos um, in the Pearson MyLab study area that you have access to um, through your subscription. So that's everything on cells and cell organelles. I know it's a lot, but a lot of it should be repetition from a high school or other biology class. And if you just go through the textbook, take some notes, and use the study area, practice area in Pearson, you got this.